Good Wednesday morning. I, today I'm going to switch over from the prophets over to St. Luke, okay? And it's an interesting text, especially, I'm going to show it to you, because in many ways, we lived this text when we joined religious life. And in the 50s especially, and way before, these texts were taken absolutely literally. I mean it absolutely. I'll read it to you, okay? It's the truth, too. He said, as Jesus and his disciples were proceeding on their journey, someone said to him, I'll, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus answered him, foxes have dens, birds in the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. And to another he said, follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. But he answered him, let the dead bury the dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to my family and home. At home, Jesus answered, no one who sets his hand to the plow and looks to what less was left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, he was really referring to in these texts, okay, he was referring to those who were Jews becoming Christians or pagans becoming Christians and the cost of discipleship. That's what he's saying. Okay, he's using probably the most stark language where he's the most fundamental of all mor morality is one's obligations to one's family, period. Okay? And he's saying, forget about it. When I call you, you leave. You don't look over your shoulder. You leave. You see? That's what he's saying. See, let the dead bury the dead. You know, in the order, being honest with you, okay, well, we left home. We left home, and our home became the order. And in, in my time, this is me, in my time, up until, well, it's not anymore, but at the time, we were able to ride home, I believe, once a month, we're never called home, or very, very rarely called home. And even in our time, it was loosening up a lot. Father Augustine Paul Hennessy was our rector at the seminary, and Gus, brilliant, brilliant theologian. He was, he began to humanize that spirituality far more, way, way more. Prior to that, it was stark. It was stark. You, put your hand to the plow, you didn't look back. In a lot of ways, that was the case. I could say that once I joined the order, I did not look back to my family in the same way. In other words, every decision that I made, everything that I did was aimed in terms of the order and moving forward. I didn't, um, my family didn't come into, in that sense, consideration where I was going to go and how I was going to get there and whatever the future held. That was solely the business of the order. That was not unusual. That was normal. That was absolutely normal in the outfit. So when I came to St. Louis University, I didn't talk to them. I told my folks they were proud of me. I was going on for a PhD. But it wasn't as if I took, I consulted with them or kept them. I was just letting them know what I was going to do. So, it's, it's interesting, the radical calling of religious life. It followed this literally, very, trust me, very, very seriously. Looking back, years later, they changed all that. We probably, I became closer to my family, honestly, closer to my family through the order, but it came later. In fact, I learned to see my family better because of the order. That was the irony of it all. While we left, we began to see and rejoin. I don't know how else to put it. I told you that story before. It was just three or four years into the outfit when we had dinner at my house. A whole bunch of us, including the rector, okay, or the director. And one of my classmates, Jim Palermo, said, you have a great family. And Norb Dorsey became bishop, became a bishop. And Orlando Florin, I think it was, he said, Ted, you don't appreciate your family enough. I learned to really see them. But I had first left them and his radicals. And not that I didn't love them, but this was the calling. See, it was heroic calling. It's a form of martyrdom. And it was taken that way. I think of the men that went to China 
They got on a boat with a one-way ticket back in the 20s and 30s. Some are still buried there. It's a radical religious life, at least in its monastic form. I think in almost all forms, it was very, very radical in that regard. You know, it was a it was a call. It was to 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 service. It was a call to the church. My my niece Michelle asked me why I became a priest. That was a unique way of saying it. The real question: Why did you become a passionist? She didn't answer it that way. I would have said I felt called. And it's the truth. I felt called. I still do. It's hard to explain it, but it's a call, a, a call to self-sacrifice in many, many ways. It's hard for me to say that here, living in the comfort of my career and my life. But the reality is, it is a call to sacrifice. You sacrifice the intimacy of personal love and family, the one to be your own. You're never married. You never have children. You never have that kind of companionship, which you can give your life to. I've had intimately close friends, etc. I have not been alone in this life. I've been blessed beyond words. But there's a radical emptiness too. There's a radical way in which you leave, you leave that, you leave behind. You know, you go where you're called to go. I don't know how else to put it. I'm not saying it well, but I just remember how, when I look at this text, I remember, I remember the first years that I was in monastic life and how, pre what's the word I want? How demanding it was in its own kind of way, how radical it was, not demanding, how radical it was. You went forward, you didn't look back. I don't remember when we were novices, you wrote home once a month and that was one page. But our folks figured something out, though, uh, besides. So they, if they sent us something, we had to thank them. So they always sent us packages of goodies, okay? And we, we thanked them. We sent them a card thanking them. Well, in that card, you could cram an awful lot into a card. You know what I mean? We would tell them what was going on. So it was never harsh. It was stark, but it wasn't harsh. And as I said, in the end, I got closer to my family by far, by leagues, because of the order. I learned to really love and honor my mother and father, really love them, and see them in that keen sense. See, my classmates loved my parents. I mean, they, they showed me what was there. They saw what I was looking at and didn't see. Then they saw, and I saw, that I was blessed with a marvelous family. Yeah, this is the truth, it's the truth. Now, see? So anyway, and that while this text says, let the dead bury the dead, boy, by the way, we did go home. We did not go home to the funerals in the beginning, okay? <laughs> to tell you the truth. But in another way, we became closer to our families. We became closer. By, in a way, leaving, we gained them. It certainly happened to me, and I heard other guys say the same thing. Maybe because you never took them for granted. You began to see them with your heart, and you saw how precious your family was, how precious your mom and dad, precious your sibs, you see? Your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, your family. To this day, I pray for my family every day. It was asked by one of my colleagues, when you go to paradise, when you die and go to heaven, what do you look forward to? I said, I wanna be with my family again. I couldn't have said that in 1959 but I could say it now. I want to be with my family again. And those I have loved and been loved by. See, that's neat, isn't it? That's because I walked away once, because I was called away once. But in the end, I was given it back. And in eternity, I'll have it without end. I want to be with my family and those I have loved and been loved by.